Alright, hello everyone, my brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome back to the Matthew study. Um, I have no idea whether or not you're able to hear this because there's a chance, I don't know how long I have, I either have about 10 minutes or I have like two and a half, three hours to do this. So if I have the 10 minutes, like I don't know, if I have the 10 minutes you're never going to hear this, if I have the like two and a half, three hours, well then you are going to hear this. So I suppose there's no point in this, we might as well get into it actually. Before we do, of course, we're starting off now, like I said, Matthew 7, and obviously the first verse in Matthew 7 is Matthew 7, 1, which is possibly the most quoted verse in the entire Bible, because not only is it quoted by Christians, it's also quoted by non-Christians. It's quoted by people who understand it, and people who have no idea what they're talking about, you know, with these... It's different groups of people all like to quote it. In fact, they don't even quote it. They don't even quote it. They just quote the first two words. They don't even quote the full verse. Just the first two words. And what are those words? Judge not. And then that's it. They don't quote anything else. They don't elaborate nothing else. If you do, <laughs> if you're coming off as even slightly judgy, you know, if they did something bad and you let them know it wasn't a good thing to do, well, your Bible says judge not. You know, and, and of course, people will often bring up the verse then, it's either Psalms or Proverbs, I think Psalms. You know, if we go by this logic, the Bible also says there is no God. Because there's a, a verse in, I think it's the Psalms, it says, the fool says there is no God. You know, so if we're only taking even less than half of verses, if we're only taking a fraction of, verse, fraction of the verses, uh, we're coming to entire theologies based on those fractions of verses, there is no God. Because there's a verse that says, you know, the fool says that there is no God. Personally, I would like to do it the other way. I just go, <laughs> there's a verse in the Bible that says, the fool says, and leave it at that. There's a great mystery, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, seriously. That's, oh, the fly from yesterday is back. Ooh, sorry, well, not yesterday from me, not yesterday from you, love. Anyway, that's not how we study the Bible. There's no serious Bible scholar. There's no, like, biblical... Like commentary, there's no one who ever studies the Bible in this way. There is nobody throughout the history of Christianity or Judaism who has ever took half of a verse, dragged it kicking and screaming out of context, and then based a good chunk of theology on that semi-verse, on that fraction of a verse, right? No one has ever done that with anything else except Matthew 7 1. And even then, none of the serious people do it. No, no, just the, the just people who don't know what they're talking about, essentially. Just people who don't know what they're talking about. This is like taking the Bible out of context, taking it to a whole new level. Most of the time when people take the Bible out of context, they'll take a verse or a snippet or something like that. You know, they'll take a verse or a few verses. There's very few times that I can think of where someone would only take part of a verse. And of course you might think, well the rest of the verse doesn't really change much. I think it does. I think the rest of the verse changes a lot. If you read the full verse, it well maybe not changes a lot. But the full context of the four verses right after it changes a lot. But when you read the full verse, you get something slightly different than when you just read the first two words. So remember, the first two words, judge not. What's the full verse? Well, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Now that changes it. Judge not is a, a general rule, a command. You do not judge. Whereas, judge not that you be not judged is something slightly different. Because now there's an implication. Now there's the implication, if you do judge, you'll be judged. If you don't judge, you won't be judged. So it's more of like, you know, it, it, it implies this idea of do to others as you have done to you, sort of a thing. Right? Which just isn't implied from the first two words. So when you read the full, even if you don't read the four verses afterwards, which we obviously have to do, because they're part of the, the segment. Um... They're part of this message that Jesus is preaching. But even if you don't, just from the first full verse by itself, not even getting any other context, just from the first one verse, you do very much get this idea that it's not as simple as don't judge. You do very much get the idea that there is something more to it, something beyond it. So that's sort of why a lot of people have to take just two words, judge not or don't judge, depending on the translation, you know, two or three words, do not judge, judge not, don't judge, that sort of a thing. That's why they have to do it, because most of the time, sorry, I just thought I heard something there. Anyway, most of the time, they have, they can just take, they get away with, they take one verse or a few verses and they take them out of context and that's enough to get what they want. In this case, they can't even do that. In this case, they take the full verse, 
there's still an inkling left of that idea that they want to get rid of, which we'll get more into in a minute. And so they have to take less than, here, hold on, I want to see something. So there's seven words. So they, they, they take two sevenths of the entire verse. That's that's not a lot. That's, that's quite a little, that, that's very small. <laughs> they take two sevenths of a verse and they try and undermine such a great amount of theology. They take two sevenths, right, of this one verse and they try to, I guess, make it overrule four and five sevenths verses. <laughs> You know, because the next four verses really don't say, don't judge. There's something completely different going on. So I'm going to read through the five now. I'm going to read through all five verses. And then I'm going to go back through them and say what it really means. Okay. So chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, ye shall be, um, it shall be measured to you again. And what bo um, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mort of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mort out of thy brother's eye. So, we get a very different idea of what Jesus is trying to say here, when we look at what he's actually saying, other than half of one of his sentences, or less than half. All right? So, let's go back through it again. Judge not that ye be not judged. What's that implying? Well, it's first of all, it's starting off, it's implying this idea of standards. This idea of uh, standards is what standard do you hold yourself to? What standard, you know, do you think people should be held to? Judge and you'll be judged. Don't judge, you won't be judged. If, you, if your general standard is don't judge, that's the standard to be held to you. If your standard is do judge, that's how it will be held to you. Now, of course, that's a very weak connection. But we know, like, if that was where it ended you wouldn't really be able to get it out of that but here's the beautiful thing about context is we can take something like this and we can see that's absolutely what the verse is saying because it's bolstered by the four preceding verses if we just had matthew 7 1 we didn't have the four verses after that you couldn't really get that meaning out of it too much you could maybe a little bit but you know it would be a, a slight stretch but because we have the four right afterwards we know that's what it's saying and that's the beautiful thing about context is it can change or bolster ideas Right, and here's the thing. I, I heard of this thing once. Um, apparently there's like this atheist website. They were like, they had like these contradictions, you know, these contradictions, you know, in the Bible, and they had something at the top of the, of this particular page. Like Christians will try to counteract this with like context and historical knowledge or something. It was a while ago I heard this, but it was it was along those lines. Like Christians will try to counteract this with like context and stuff like that. And you just think. Why have we made context this unimportant thing? Context is one of the most important things when you're reviewing anything, when you're reviewing any work, right? When you think, like, context is the difference between self-defense and murder, when you think about it. Like, say you kill someone, right? Well, okay, you're a murderer, but hold on, that person was threatening your life. Okay, well, then you were just acting in self-defense. See, that, that's the difference, right? Say you kill someone. We'll, we'll stick with this, because uh, I'm very morbid. Let's say you kill someone. In one context, it was some random guy walking down the road, you pull out a gun and shoot him in the head. Let's, let's say that, and I know this is very, very morbid, but stay with me. The other context is the guy, same guy, you're the same person, obviously, they're the same person, you kill them the same way, but they break into your house and with a knife or a gun or whatever, trying to kill you, right? So you shoot them in the head. Well, what's different about the situation? Well, if we remove context, then nothing. In both situations, it's the same two people, it's the same weapon, it's the same action being performed. All that's changed is the context, is the situation around it. That's what context does. It go context is the difference between an evil act and an act of self-defense. Context is extremely vital. And if your argument relies on removing a verse from its context, your argument is crap. But I don't care what it is, it's a bad argument. If your argument relies on being removed from context if you have to say the context doesn't matter if you have to try and well okay sometimes it, it doesn't right but if if you have to actively remove it from the context because if the context doesn't matter you don't have to remove it from the context but if you hack if you actually have to remove it from the context no matter i don't care what you're arguing about what the particular topic is what argument you're about to make if you have to remove something from its context you're just by definition you're just making it say something else 
and that's the classic example from the Psalms, like I said, I think it's the Psalms of Proverbs, something like that, from the Psalms of the difference between there is no God and the fool says there is no God. The context of surrounding the rest of the verse, it changes it completely from a message of atheism to theism. So, if, like I say, if you need context, like if you need to remove it from context, I don't care who you are, Christian, atheist, anything else, if your arguments rely on moving anything, Bible verse, whatever, from context, you've lost the argument before you've even started. That's all I can say. Sorry. Ridiculous. Anyway. So that's, so the, the, the context then, I forgot where I was before I started that little ramble where my thing I was, because I planned this out and I'm not sure where it is. Anyway, so, I mean, just know that you be not judged. So the context tells us this is about standards. This is about how you apply your standards, all right? And we get this from the next four verses. So let's read on at verse two. I think I've heard this, uh, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> For what, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured against, uh, measured to you again. Ju the word judge is starting to sound strange now, but again, here's this idea we get of, you know, standards. How you judge, well, that's how you will be judged. How, like, you know, if you judge a certain way, that's how you should be judged. It's this idea of standards. Um, and obviously, the, um, verse 5 then talks about hypocrisy, hypocrites. So what's hypocrisy? Well, hypocrisy, essentially, is when you have two separate standards for two separate people for no real reason. Now, obviously, certain things are going to have different standards. If you're looking at, say, the history of ancient Rome, you know, you don't expect a five-year-old to have the same standards of knowledge and research about this as a historian who has spent his life looking into these things. But in those situations, the standard is different because the historian has more authority and therefore more responsibility and therefore the standard of that for them to be right is higher. But then hypocrisy is when you take two people, let's say, well, in this it's a man and his brother, so we're assuming two equals, right? Neither one of them has greater authority, therefore greater responsibility than the other one. Neither one of them has that. So they should be held to roughly the same standards. And as we're about to find out, the man is a hypocrite because even though he has a plank in his own eye, he notes the speck in his brother's eye. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, so I'll, I'll go more into that in a few minutes about why that's you know, hypocritical. But that's sort of what this is talking about here is hypocritical judgment, judgmentalism. Don't be judgmental. Judge, don't be judgmental. There's a difference. Judging is you see someone kick a dog and you think that's a bad person. Being judgmental is, wow, that person's wearing a green coat. Ugh, they must be, there must be something wrong with them. That's judgmentalism, and it's completely different from judging, all right? And actually, I heard apparently there's an atheist, oh, I think it was an atheist, I don't think it was a Christian trying to say this, I think it was an atheist trying to um, point out things in the Bible he didn't like. He said, judge not is an active ban on the judgment system, or the, or the judges, the judicial system we have today. And and you kind of you kind of can't help but agree with them. If you take this idea of just blanket statement, judge not, then by that definition, Every legal practitioner, every judge, right, when you think about it, maybe not legal practitioner, that's a much broader term, broader term. Does that apply to judge? I don't know. Anyway, every judge, simply by doing their job, is a sinner. So when they, when they want to say, a murderer comes before them, and I guess also the jury then in that case, and they look at all the evidence, and they judge, yeah, you're a murderer. Well, no, Bible says no, according to this fragmented view of it this view that you t this view that's built on basically a lie because you have to lie about what the verse is actually saying in order to get this you know so that's that is an interesting problem with um idea of judge not being just a blanket ban on judging as you know the judicial system kind of suffers from that people simply doing their jobs these to say and obviously there are some jobs that are sinful for example um prostitute TV license inspector, I'm, I'm joking obviously, but, you know, I prostitute, stuff like that, those are obviously sinful jobs, but I don't think, you know, pushing a murderer into prison where he can't harm anybody else, I don't think that's going to send anyone to hell, do you know? Anyway, in verse 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not um, the beam that is in thine own eye? So, here we have, like I was saying before, I got ahead of myself before, but here we are now, this idea of hypocrisy. So this guy, these two equals, right, will say the man and his brother. So the man has a beam in his own eye. The man has a beam in his own eye. The, the, the other guy, the brother, has a, has a speck or a moat 
So that word means more to spec in, in all the English. That's why we need so many Bible translations because language changes. Um, so he's a speck in his eye. And so, you know, the brother, or sorry, the man even, the man, he sees that and he, he, he judges him, basically. And you might be thinking, well, well, what's wrong with that? Oh, I thought you said judging is okay. Yeah, but this is hypocritical judgment. Because one guy has a beam sticking out of his eye. The brother, he just has a speck. So the guy is like, well, my beam, I have an entire beam in my eye, but I'm fine with it. But I'm holding you to a higher standard. Even though we're equals, you don't have any greater responsibility or anything else like that than me. We're, we're equals in this case because it's a man and his brother. That's, that's why I was trying to get across is that they're equals. I'm going to hold you to a massively higher standard. Now, someone might say to this, well, hold on. What if it's like the, 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 the plank is like a, a massive tendency towards swearing, but then the little, um, the moat, whatever, is a slight um, tendency towards, you know, committing murder. Obviously, murder is worse. Therefore, in that case, it's okay, right? Well, no. And obviously, I don't know if anyone's ever actually argued that. It's just, I kind of made that up. It's like, do you know what? If you can think of literally any argument, because there's so many people, and not, all, not a lot, all of them are very clever. I mean, I'm not, but you know. So if you can think of any argument, no matter how outlandish, you know, chances are someone out there believes it, <laughs> unfortunately. So, yeah, so obviously now I think it's interesting because it's a beam and a moat, or like a beam, is, I, th I think some translations are like, a plank and sawdust or something basically they're both made of wood they're both made of the same thing i think it's what jesus is trying to get across it's the same sin being committed here it's the same basic action it's the same basic thing that these two brothers are doing they're on equal footing so they have equal responsibility and therefore equal standards should be applied to them and they're committing the same sin they're doing the same basic thing but one guy's doing it much more one guy has this big beam of wood in his eye the other guy just has a little speck but the guy, you know, the man, okay, so uh, I'll go back to man is beam guy and brother is spec guy, okay? So the man, he judges the brother, he judges his brother unfairly, unjustly. He judges him judgmentally, I suppose, because he has this entire beam out of his own eye. But he's like, and he's like fine with it. But he holds his brother to such a standard, uh, such a much higher standard that, you know, just a simple speck in his eye is like much worse but of course if he were to hold himself if the man were to hold himself to that same standard he'd see the beam in his own eye you know and he'd take it out immediately um and i think that's what this is talking about here now is the standards application um application 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 of standards i think that's what the word is uh, or how wilt thou say um to thy brother let me pull out the moat of thine own eye and behold a beam is in thy own exactly it's like well how can you hold him to this standard when you're nowhere near meeting that standard you know how can you hold someone to this standard that you yourself won't hold yourself to you know and this is what it's about it's about standards it's about hypocrisy and that's what jesus is about to say here thou hypocrite first cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mort of thy brother's eye so what jesus is talking about here is like obviously you take out the beam and then you can have the other person you deal with your own stuff first and then you deal with the other person so if anyone of you have, have ever been on a plane on an airplane you'll know they do that um safety thing at the start where they say if you're an adult traveling with children you do your own stuff first you do your own safety gear first in the event of a crash you do your own safety gear first and then and only then do you tend to the children why is this is it because every man for himself no of course not it's because you're in this situation, you're in a plane, probably very high up, the air is probably thinning if you're in that situation, you know, all these things going wrong, it's high stress, you're not thinking clearly, and you're probably, you're getting less and less clear-headed as you go along, you know, you're, you're thinking less and less clearly as the events unfold. So if you try fumbling with the child's thing, and not your own, you'll just get more and more delirious, and you're less and less able to help, and chances are both of you will not make it, unfortunately. But if you do your own first, you do your own first, well, you've got the air down, you've got, you know, you're much calmer, you've got a better chance of getting out, suddenly you're able to think a lot more clearly because you're, there's less stress, less danger to, to your own personal self, so all of a sudden, you, you know, you're more able to act in this situation, and then you turn to the child and you help them with theirs, because obviously they can't do it themselves. So because you've helped yourself and made sure you could do it, you know, and make sure you were okay and you were safe and you were able to, um, breathe and stuff now you can turn to the child and you can help them right so that that's why they do with the airplane companies and stuff that's uh, that's why the safety procedure is that obviously the natural instinct for a lot of people would be help the child first but in this case if you try and help the child first chances are you're just dooming both of you if you help yourself first you're just helping both of you 
right? And that's the goal. And obviously, that's the reason I bring this up is in the message of you should always do what you need first. Put yourself number one and then worry about the others. That's not the case. Worry about yourself first if you need to improve yourself to help other people. That's what Jesus is talking about here. It's not always get what you need first and then after that you can see if anyone else needs help. No. Your first priority should always be helping other people. But if your current state of mind or if your current state of awareness or whatever is prohibiting you from helping people, you've got to fix yourself first so you can help people. Essentially, you have to use yourself as a tool to help other people. You don't help yourself and then help others. You try and help others. And if it's required that you fix yourself to help others, you fix yourself so you can help others. And that's, I think, what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about fixing yourself, taking the plank under your own eyes so you can see and you can clearly remove the you know little speck from your brother's eye. And of course, as well, if you don't do this, it could be a lot of dangerous. You know, if you come with this plank in your eye, very obvious, and of course a plank in your eye would be very obvious, that's the point I think, is, you know, very obvious, you're not holding this standard, you are much worse at this than the brother. Well, the brother's going to see this and he's going to think, well, hold on, who are you to tell me anything? Who are you to try and help me? And then, of course, he sees this guy is much worse than him, he's probably going to get defensive, he's probably not going to, you know, he's going to be worrying more about the brother's beam than his own spec. And he's not going to try and remove his own specs. So that can, you know, that can really lead to a lot of dangers and a lot of problems. It can lead to people seeing you as being judgmental, which fair enough, I think you are being in that situation. So really the best thing is you remove the plank from your eye. You fix yourself, not for the sake of fixing yourself, but for the sake of the people who you need to help and who you are hindering by being the way you are. You fix yourself so you can help others. Like on the plane, you do your own gear first, not because you care more about yourself, but because you need to, so you can help the child. And this is what Jesus is talking about here. And this is, I think, one of the core elements. There's a few different core elements that make up the Bible in terms of, or the way Jesus is teaching, in terms of how we are meant to live our lives. There's love, kindness, forgiveness, all this stuff. One of the core elements of how we are meant to live our lives according to the teachings of Jesus is selflessness. Now, selflessness is not always helping, it's not just abandoning your own needs to help other people. And it's not always doing what other people need first, because obviously if you try and do what other people need first, they can hinder them, like we learn here. It's doing what needs to be done. Selflessness is doing what needs to be done to make sure the interests of the people around you are met. And by interest, I mean the godly interest, obviously, not, not the worldly interest. That would be a bit strange for Jesus to preach, but it's making sure the people around you and if that means you have to abandon your own needs and help them, then do it. But if it means you have to fix yourself first, and then, and only then, when you actually be able to help them, well, then you fix yourself and then you help them. That's what selflessness is. And, and of course, we have to remember as well, selflessness is not you don't care about yourself anymore. Okay? Selflessness, selflessness is people you love are more important than yourself. It's not, you are not important. Every, everyone should be important to themselves, their health, their well-being, mental health, physical health, all this stuff. But that should never trump the love you have for other people. It should never trump your desire to help other people. It should never come before helping other people. And it should certainly never hinder helping other people. Selflessness is helping other people. It is not refusing to help yourself. Okay? So that's that. Now, obviously, we're only 20 minutes in, and I don't want this to be like yesterday. Well, yes, it was yesterday for me, it was, I think a couple of days ago for you. I don't want to repeat that again. I, and I am sorry, I did get interrupted last time. I, I would probably have gone on for at least a little bit more um, last time. Probably not too much, wouldn't maybe just under half an hour, or around a half hour. Um, so only a few more minutes, but I got interrupted, unfortunately, so I did have to end it. So I am sorry, that's sort of my explanation for that. So I am sorry about that. And that's what I was saying before. It's like if I get interrupted in this, I'm not doing a, like a really short one again, I'll just redo this whole thing. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to keep going. I think we won't get chapter 7 done today. I haven't even studied love. I've only studied up until about verse 8. Uh, or like, uh, well, I don't know. I've done a little bit beyond that. But in terms of getting ready for today, I've only gone up until verse 8. So I'll probably finish chapter 7 the next day. Anyway, let's continue. So number 6. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. So what's this talking about? Well, this is talking about, I think, evangelizing people, trying to give people the truth. And we're going to see more about this again in the next two verses after this. 
I, I think this is the main message about these three verses, this one and the two afterwards, which we'll get into in a few minutes. Um, is is you know trying to help other people, but don't give don't don't bother with people who are not going to receive it. Essentially, it, it's it's not as simplistic as that. I don't think the verse is making out to me. So let's say I'm going to use an analogy. Let's say you have five people. All right, the first four are not going to receive the gospel. You obviously don't know this. It's just the truth. They're not going to. They're not going to receive. The fifth is. Okay. So let's say you go up to the first one. And you say. You try and give them the pearls. They reveal themselves to be swine. Right. In this. Or dogs. Whatever. In this thing. Right. But you keep going. You keep at it. You keep trying. Wasting a load of time. And eventually. You both get frustrated. And you give up. Now you move on to the second person. Rinse and repeat. Third person. Again. Fourth person. Again. Fifth person. Well what's happened? Well the first four. Have made you cynical. The first four have made you upset, and you're like, well, okay, there doesn't seem to be anyone receiving this. So maybe you try less. Maybe you put less effort in. And as well as that, with the fifth guy, maybe he has problems, spiritual problems. You've made him wait longer now, right? You've wasted so much time in getting to this guy. Things might have got worse. You know, things might have developed. Things might have happened that, you know, it would have been, a, it would have been really nice to go through those things with Christ and stuff like that, you know? To, like, go through the storm with Christ by your side, that sort of thing. But anyway, you've wasted both of your times now. <laughs> but anyway. You're there, and let's say you're not cynical. Well, you finally got there, and now you can preach to him, right? Well, actually, no, you are cynical, sorry. Um, but let's say you're there, you finally preach to him. Let's say there's a little bit of pushback. Now you're used to the pushback from those lot. And you're like, well, okay, there's a little bit, I'm not wasting my time again, and you move on. You don't you don't minister to the fifth guy, even though he would have received, received it. Because you've just made this experience of yourself of, well, I try and I fail, and I try and I fail, so let me try a little bit, and then I'll move on. But in reality, it should be the other way around. You try, you test the waters, you see. If you if someone reveals that they're not going to accept the gospel, they, using this analogy, reveal themselves to be a dog or a swine, move on. That's not to say you just say, well, they don't know how they receive it, I'll move on, or anything like that. You should always make a bit of an effort. But don't be frivolous about it. You know, make make a reasonable effort. And how much effort you make will depend on the person. Maybe it'll take a few minutes to realize, or a few seconds to realize they're not going to accept it. Maybe it'll take a few days. It depends, you know, it really depends on the person. But once you realize they're not accepting it, move on. Because there's other people who need your help. All right? And they just make you, you know, it'll just make you, um, what's the word? Cynical, like I say. But the fifth guy, if they receive it and they don't believe, that's good. That's, well, obviously, the best the best case scenario is they receive and believe. But if they receive it and they don't believe, that's good because it shows their mind is open. They are willing to listen. They are willing to hear this. So if you show them the truth, there's a good chance they'll accept it. But if you if they receive it and they don't believe, you might confuse that for them being one of the swine or one of the dogs. And you think there's no point and you move on. And now there's someone who would have received those pearls who's not. Who's not going to because of all this time you've spent getting more and more and more cynical. And I understand. I do like I do live streams on my TikTok. I do. Um and I understand because uh, like I spend like like an hour dealing with a bunch of people coming in being rude and stuff and then one guy comes in with a genuine question that's worded slightly off and I make a mistake I think that they're one of the others and I just ignore them that sort of thing or you know something like that so I understand it's it's easy enough to fall into these traps we do have to be really careful if you're really careful about this that we don't mistake people who aren't going to receive with those who will and those who will with those who aren't and of course to know who will and won't we have to take the time to actually try and if we try and they make it obvious they're not receiving, move on. If they make it obvious they are receiving, but they aren't believing yet, well, that's how it goes. Some people might, you know, if you're really good, some people might only take a few seconds, some might a few minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries. But, you know, it, it can take a long time. It can take a long time. But if they're receiving, it shows that they're open to it. And of course, as a Christian, I do believe that Christianity is true. I believe that it is the truth of the world. I believe the truth of God is the only truth. So I believe that they are open to the truth. If they genuinely are open to the truth, they will receive it. And that's what we're about to talk about now in the next two verses. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that asketh findeth, or seeketh findeth, sorry, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now this is a great verse for the prosperity gospel. People love this verse because they think it's like, well, asking it should receive. But clearly that means I ask for anything and God will give it to me. You know, it's almost like this implication of God doesn't have the right or the ability to say no to people, that sort of thing, which is 
not true. He can say no. I think what this is talking about when you take into context like the, the, the last verse specifically, when you look at it, I think it's talking about spreading the gospel or receiving Christ. If you look for the truth, and of course I think we looked at it before, what was it? it was like those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall find it or something like it was like hung, like righteousness or truth or something like that. If you're genuinely looking for the truth, I believe you will find it in Christ, in the one true God in the Bible. Right? Now there's a there's a guy, he was an atheist detective, um like J. Warner Wallace or something like that. Warner Wallace, I think. Warner J. Whatever his name. Warner Wallace was part of his name. And there was a J in there somewhere. Um, and he was, and basically what he did was he set out to disprove the resurrection. Right? And he was a detective. He'd spent so long with, you know, eyewitnesses and evidence and all this stuff. So he goes gathering this evidence. But because he genuinely believes it's not true, this is my theory of what happened anyway, because he genuinely believes it's not true, he has, an, he, he has an open look at, at the evidence and he accepts it for what it is. And that's probably due to his background as a detective and yeah. Oh, excuse me. The background is a de detective, and you know, looking into all that stuff and seeing what's true and what's not. Um, this atheist detective setting out to disprove the resurrection, after looking at all the evidence, converts to Christianity. Right. The truth is in the gospel. The truth is in the resurrection. He is risen. That is undeniable at this stage. All right, and people say, "Oh no, well, I, well, I'm not personally convinced." Which I mean, if I turn it around to them, okay, I'm not personally convinced that you exist. In the face of undeniable evidence, I'm just not personally convinced. You know, it's it's not a great argument. It's like if you have actual problems with the evidence, that's something to talk about. Well, if your problem is nice, nah, not enough, like you know, in that case, I think you're just possibly being more like someone. Obviously, in that case, if it's like it's not enough. It's hard to explain because there's a difference between no, I don't want to hear it, and the evidence you've so far presented has been so far. All right, obviously, no one's going to word it this, the, the way I worded it, but they're like, you know, there's a difference between no, I don't care, it's not, I don't care, and so far it hasn't been enough. Those are two different things. You know, the evidence isn't enough, and what you've shown me isn't enough, essentially, right? It's like, well, I've seen all the evidence, and it's still not enough. Is that, well, I, you're just not open to it at that stage. I, I just, you know, an atheist setting out to disprove it ended up being converted. You know, like, who's, like this guy whose job it was to source out what's true and what's not. And, you know, like, you know, like, that's that's pretty convincing by itself. That's that's nothing, obviously. But, like, when you look at the evidence he had, you look at all the evidence, like, all this different stuff, I, I think there is a very good case for it. Um, you know, so, so just go, it's not good enough for me. And, like, fine, whatever, but if it's like, well, the evidence you've shown so far isn't good enough, but they're still open to it, they're still receiving, but not believing, you keep giving them the evidence, you keep giving them the reasons, whether it's historical, um, I don't know, if I can, uh, what, what's the thing to do with your brain, a philosophical, that sort of thing, whatever your reason, just keep giving them reasons, because they show they're open to it, what you've shown so far isn't enough, so show more. Because if they're open to it, I think there's enough evidence. I think if they're not being ridiculous about it and not looking for a ridiculous amount of evidence, the evidence we have is quite good, you know? Because here's the thing with historical documents. A lot of things are documented in history. There's not, like, a lot of evidence for them, you know? So, but we don't take them as being not true, you know? And I, I think there was a historian who talked about, like, the, the New Testament and the authorship and the, and the Gospels and stuff. He said this many different... Um, I'm paraphrasing now, but like this many, like it was like there was something to do with like the the evidence that was provided by the New Testament, and as well as that by like other writings, like Tacitus, Josephus about Jesus and stuff. I'm pretty sure it was it's a while ago I heard this now. So, but I think it's like he basically he called it gold dust. He said this sort of stuff is like gold dust. That's how like that's how strong this. That's how good this this evidence is. This isn't like I did a video there a, a while ago about blind faith. This is not a blind faith thing. There's good. Some people go off blind faith, and I don't think that's going to go very well. I think that could lead to destruction. This is not a blind faith thing. This is the truth. We looked for the truth. We found the truth because there's good reason to believe it. And I think that's what this verse is talking about here. When you go with an open mind and an open heart, looking for the truth, not just looking at the Christian sources, but looking at everything, looking into Islam, atheism, Buddhism, Christianity, all of it, I think the undeniable truth lies in Christianity, in the resurrection, in the one true God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, I think that's where the truth is, and I think that's what the Bible here is saying, I think that's what this verse is saying, seek and you shall find, seek the truth and it shall, it shall present itself to you, you shall find it, of course if you go look and, like, and of course there's people who are like, well, well I, I, I looked at the historical accuracy of the, the New Testament, uh, but I discounted the idea that miracles could happen, 
and I came to the conclusion that the miracles didn't happen. And like, oh, that's amazing. You know, I came to the conclusion that I'm actually from Mars. So, th um, you know, actually, no, sorry. I, I decided to prove I'm from Mars, and I discounted any evidence that said I wasn't from Mars, and I actually came to the conclusion that I am from Mars. Do you know? It, it, it's, it's funny. When you discount all the evidence that goes against your presupposition, you're going to get a pretty good case for your presupposition. That's just how it works. And so I think the, a good rebuttal to that sort of thing is just as a Christian to go, okay, well, I'm going to look into it too, and I'm going to discount the idea that they didn't happen. I'm going to discount the idea that there was no miracles. I'm going to go in supposing that they did, they did happen. You know, if, if we can make suppositions like this, presuppositions, if we can just suppose things are true before we've actually seen the evidence for them, but if you can do that and say that they didn't happen, I can do it and say that they did. And of course, you go against that, well, that's hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy. At that stage, it's like, well, no, no, I can make presuppositions, but you can't. That's hypocrisy. That's just hypocrisy. So, and of course, Christians, I do encourage you to do this. If you're looking into the truth of Christianity, the best thing to do is not to assume that it's true. Don't assume it's not true. Go on completely neutrally, right? Look at the evidence. And just remove yourself. Obviously, we all have bias. Don't I, 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 I try to be as non biased as possible. Bias is a strange word that gets passed around a lot. It's like, oh, well, they're biased, so you shouldn't listen. Everyone's biased. Everyone, there's, there's, there hasn't been a single person throughout all of human history who is biased. It's, that, that's just not a thing. No one with a functioning brain has the capacity to not be biased. Okay? So. You know, but try and be as unbiased as possible because there's a difference between you being biased and being overly biased. Because if you recognize your bias, I think you can manage it. But if you delude yourself into thinking you have no bias, you're probably being more biased because you're you're like, well, I don't have any bias, therefore what I say is more likely to be true. So you're actually being more biased towards what you're you know towards what you're saying. If you get me, so you know, if you, I recognize your bias, manage it accordingly, and don't and go in. Don't suppose God is real. Don't suppose He isn't. If you want to look into this evidence, look into it without this filter of presupposition and I think you'll find there is good evidence for it I think there really is don't go in trying to prove what you already believe go in trying to find the truth and I think you will come out with the idea of Christianity I think if you go in you're not trying to prove anything you're just trying to figure it out I genuinely believe that will lead to Christianity and I'm not going to go any further with Matthew I think I'm just going to talk a little bit about some things while we're kind of on this topic um, we'll probably finish that. Uh, 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 we'll probably finish chapter seven. I was going to say we we'll finish Matthew. We'll probably finish chapter seven um, in the next one. So, but I want to talk about like like looking into um, the Bible and looking into the truth. You know, seeking you shall find that sort of a thing. I've heard like Christians shoot themselves in the foot so much here. We really do, and we need to get so much better. Like I've heard atheist testimonies, but why they became Christian and like. I think I heard one guy or one girl, whoever it was, was like, well, when I was still a Christian, I, I, I said to like the pastor that I was looking into, into the religion. And they said, well, be careful because too much research can lead people away from the faith. And you're like, okay, if I heard that, I'd immediately doubt myself. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's such a stupid thing to say. And obviously, like, the concern is a real one, I think, like, like between research and bad research, obviously. It's like, because here's the thing. If you go, like, the thing I always go to is, like, flat earth, right? Obviously, the earth is round. If you go trying to see whether or not the earth is round or flat, and you only look at flat earth websites, and you don't look at anything else, you're going to have a pretty strong case for a flat earth, because you don't know what anyone else is saying. You don't know any of the rebuttals or any of the other arguments. So you're going to come to the conclusion that the earth is flat. It's not, but that's the conclusion you're going to come to, because you haven't allowed yourself to look at the facts, you haven't allowed yourself to look at anything else. You've looked at one source, one thing, and that's it. And I think that's ridiculous. So it's like, it's like when people deconstruct, they never want to look at the Christian arguments. They want to just look at the, the atheist arguments. And this is something I've tried to force myself to do recently. I've tried, I've started trying to watch more um, atheist content and and stuff like that. Just to, so I'm not in like an echo chamber and just try to uh, see what other people are saying and stuff like that. Because as a Christian, I do believe it's true. I don't believe I need to be in an echo chamber. I believe I can. I believe these arguments have rebuttals. I do. I believe that the truth is in Christianity, so there's no point in hiding from atheism, you know? So that's something I've tried to make myself do, but it's unfortunate because I've seen, like, a lot of, um, 
atheism it's it's or there are some good ones i found thankfully but there's a lot of the time where it's just it's not here's my argument for atheism it's just no christianity is stupid and bad <laughs> you know that sort of thing so it's yeah it's, it's hard trying to suss out you know people who are making genuine arguments and people who are just upset um and of course a lot and there is a lot of appeal to emotion unfortunately it's like well if if god then why bad you know that that famous famous line you know if god then why bad thing which is essentially the the like the entire book of job which is i believe 42 chapters long is pretty much dedicated to answering this question you know it's like there's a, there's an entire book of the bible one of the most famous books of the bible in fact dedicated to answering this question and i might even study job one day because it's a fantastic book but you know it's like it's not like we it's, it's it's not like this is a mystery it's not like the bible ever says well god's real therefore nothing bad has ever happened like that's not how that works it's like me going up to an atheist and like well if atheism is true why am i wearing a hat it's like well what does that have to do with anything you know it, it, it's just it's frustrating and it's it is, it's, it's quite annoying but i think there are good arguments that do need to be addressed and, and that's why i try and find them bother with you know the, the nonsense ones of like the emotional arguments because how do you combat you can't combat an emotional argument with a logical answer do you know it's like well because like if it, if they were if they cared about the logic they quote the logic they wouldn't go with the fake emotions um, the best way to answer an emotional argument is with another emotion but that just leads you down a rabbit hole where you no longer care about what's actually going on it's just your perception and how you personally feel about it and that's different depending on different people so obviously I can't answer like someone has one emotional feeling towards a certain thing. I have a different emotional feeling towards it. This isn't grounded in any reality or any truth. This is just how we personally feel about it. So how how am I meant to use my personal emotion to combat their personal emotion? You can't. So there's no there's no good way to answer an, an emotion an answer from emotion or a, 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 an argument from emotion except to completely dismiss it because it's just not a good argument. You know. So, and I think we, I, I don't like, I, like, in Christian still, it's just about, you know, it's like, like, we don't use, like, actual logic sometimes, we just try to do, like, emotion, it's like, well, isn't your life so bad? Wouldn't it be so much better if you had God? As you come on, you, you know you want it, you're like, well, you're just, at that stage, it's like, you know, you're just like, you're, you're trying to appeal to their emotions and be like, they're having a bad time, I'm going to use that to get them to believe what I believe. And at that stage as well, you're kind of just using God, like you're, you're encouraging them to basically use God to get what they want, you know, like prosperity gospel, which is basically just an abusive relationship at that stage, if it were true, if that's what it actually was, it's like, we don't love God, but we use him to get what we want, that's, that's just a, an abusive relationship, essentially, excuse me, essentially, but yeah, so I think, and if you're an atheist watching this, yeah, thank you for being open-minded and listening through and all that stuff and if you do make arguments against christianity fair enough just try and stay away from emotions from argument and do try and listen to what the other side has to say and christians you listen to what the other side has to say too i think we all need to listen to what the other side has to say rather than just you know immediately being like well i'm right so therefore i don't need to listen to them we do need obviously you know don't listen to the bad arguments don't listen to the stupid stuff don't focus in on that because that's something i see as well it's like like you know atheists will target say Joe from down the road who has only read half the Bible and they're like that's their level they're like they won't actually carry any real arguments but then when it comes to things like um say dealing with theistic evolution and stuff like that they're like well we can't like because they like to use like creationism and stuff well, well Christianity denies science well I'm a theistic evolutionist I there's no modern scientific belief that I deny that I know of so you know it's like well, well well, no, Bible say this, you have to believe this. What they'll either do is what they've done, what some people don't mean. It's like, you know, they're like, they try and convince me that's what the Bible actually says. Which, by the way, if you convince me that the Bible teaches young earth creationism, I won't become an atheist. I'll become a young earth creationist. All right. Um, but that's, that's what they try and do is like, so they'll either, they'll either, if they come across theistic evolutionists, they're either trying to convince them that the Bible teaches creationism. Or they just won't deal with the theistic evolutionists because it's much easier to deal with the creationists and say no you deny science you know and I, and that's what this and that's not what all of them do obviously i'm talking about certain individuals here 
I'm not talking about any major group or, or any, any group at all. I'm just talking about certain individuals within certain groups. And then Christians do this as well sometimes. They, they target the worst of the worst arguments and like to make themselves feel smart. You know, which I mean, fair enough if you're not like like qualified to tackle the big arguments. But in that case, just don't tackle the arguments. Just, you know, talk like talk about what you want to talk about. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you're not qualified to be tackling these bigger arguments, well, then there's other ways to spread the gospel. There's other ways to do this stuff, you know, so it's what's it for your best at really. Um I'm sort of rambling off this stage. But I do hope you guys have enjoyed this. Um thank you for listening, of course. Uh, and I don't really have anything else to say, so bye and God bless.